Thank you for choosing the OECD podcast. Hello, I'm Kate Lancaster, and I'm here with Eric Bernjolfsen, professor at the MIT Sloan School, director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy, and research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research in the United States. He is the author or co-author of numerous publications, including the best-selling The Second Machine Age, Work, Progress, and Prosperity in a Time of Brilliant Technologies. Hello, Eric, and thank you for being here with us today. My pleasure, Kate. So it's been four years since the second machine age came out. What's changed? Well, a lot has changed. And I think if I were to summarize into two big categories, I don't think we were ambitious or optimistic enough about some of the changes in the technology. The breakthroughs in machine learning have in many ways been more impressive than I expected. Uh, we now have vision systems that uh, can outperform humans in many applications. Uh, we're beginning to just talk to our machines and have them understand us. Uh, which would have been kind of weird uh, a, a while back. Um, and a lot of uh, people are rushing into the area of machine learning at a rate even faster. The second thing, though, is, is not as optimistic. I'd say um, our political system and our social systems have been even slower to react. In fact, I would almost say they've gone backwards in many ways. And this is uh, leading to an even worse mismatch than we described in the book. Can you give us an example of what you mean by going backwards? Well, you know, there's been a, a, a lot of people who've been hurt by this change in the technology and the change in the economy as some of the old jobs get automated away. And the reaction, I guess somewhat understandably, has been to try to cling to those old jobs, you know, bring mm -hmm. back, I don't know, the coal mining jobs. Or in my hometown of Boston, uh, I put special taxes on Uber and Lyft to uh, subsidize taxis. And this basically boils down to trying to protect the past from the future. And that is not a strategy for success. Um, the way that America, the way that every country has succeeded in the past is by embracing the future and finding ways to adapt more smoothly rather than try to uh, stop the future from happening. Well, you ended the second machine age with a terrific set of policy recommendations, where we might go, mm -hmm. how to make this work for everyone, how to, mm -hmm. for, as, as progress moves forward, we all move with it. Right. Do you think in the four years we've inched closer to some of those policy recommendations? No. No. <laughs> I've no. spent a lot of time talking to, uh, you know, top people in government, and uh, I think many of them understand these issues, but the problem is I think the average citizen really isn't on board with it. We mm -hmm. didn't do a good enough job communicating that to a broader audience. I'm glad we're doing this podcast because I think uh, things like uh, reinventing education and training, uh, like the earned income tax credit, uh, like reducing regulations to make it easier to have um, a transition and rather than, than putting up new barriers. Those are things that would have smoothed the transition, uh, but more often than not, uh, we're, we're often doing the opposite. Well, then let's talk about how these changes are or could play out for real people. Someone mm -hmm. uh, leaving school, about to leave school, someone mid-career, uh, mid-working life and figuring out what next. Uh, what do these changes look like for them? Well, I think what we're seeing is that the types of skills demanded in the workforce are rapidly evolving, and they're going to change even more in the next 10 years than in the last 10 years. In particular, uh, there's less demand for routine information processing skills, for repetitive kinds of work. Uh, there's more demand for creative work, uh, large-scale problem solving, and interestingly, for interpersonal skills. Machines mm -hmm. aren't that great at sort of uh, comforting a sick child or an older person or um, motivating somebody in a team or negotiating or selling. These are things where human connections can be very important. So we need to spend more time uh, training people in either the creative side or the people side or both, and less time sort of uh, training people to follow instructions and memorize rote facts. And so this is something that can help us to then predict what jobs there will be, what skills are needed. I understand you worked on a a schema to help people sort that out? Yes. So machine learning is an amazing technology, but we are very far from what AI researchers call artificial general research, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, artificial general intelligence, which is this idea that machines can do just about everything. Uh, the, the few things they can do very well, it's amazing. They're at human or superhuman levels. So my work with Tom Mitchell and with Daniel Rock has tried to come up with a, a set of questions, 23 questions, in yeah. fact, that distinguish which tasks can be done by machines and which ones can't be done. And then we've applied this 
to the occupations in the U.S. economy. There's a big data set called ONET that has divided the whole U.S. economy into 964 occupations, uh, nearly 20,000 distinct tasks within those occupations. And this gives us a, a sense of which tasks are more automatable and less automatable going forward, and therefore which kinds of skills are going to be needed and where the new businesses and new opportunities are going to be going forward. Uh, we wrote it in this uh, journal called Science, uh, the mm -hmm. magazine, and so anybody can access it. It's free, and uh, you can apply it to your own businesses. And so it's more about job redesign then than saying not this position is going to become completely obsolete, but... That's right. You read yeah, the article clearly I, because that was one of the <laughs> key takeaways. Is I that, was very impressed by the article. Thank you. Um, is yeah. that when we looked at the different occupations, there is virtually no occupation where machine learning just ran the table, was able to do all the tasks okay. for that occupation. You know, a radiologist needs to read images, but they also need to talk to patients, they need to coordinate with other doctors. And these are things that machines don't do well. So what we concluded was that rather than a uh, machine learning replacing the whole occupation, it would automate parts of it and augment other parts of it. And therefore, we need to reinvent and re-engineer these tasks. And that falls to entrepreneurs. It falls to the people in the occupations themselves to think about how to redesign their occupation to take advantage of the small parts that machine learning can do well and still have humans do the other parts. It's interesting looking at the different parts of a job that need to be done. We engaged someone with young people in France recently mm -hmm. with a group of students in a Paris suburb about the future of work, mm -hmm. about what jobs they might want to do. And one of them in asking him, what did he think about automation and machine learning? He said, well, all the fun parts of the job will now be for me. And I don't know if that's an oversimplification. I or think it... it's pretty close to being spot on correct. I mean, I guess well, it depends on what news. you consider fun. I think it is good news because the truth is machines are really good at doing rote, repetitive work. They're not good at creativity. They're not good at thinking outside the box. And they're not good at connecting with other people. I mean, we have some kind of, uh, and I'm not a biologist, but there seems to be a deep-rooted uh, part of our brain that connects with other humans in a way that we don't connect with machines mm -hmm. and machines don't connect with us. So for now and for the next few decades, I think, uh, interpersonal and creative tasks, which are the parts that most of us find most fun, are exactly the ones that humans will be most needed for. And that's wonderful and optimistic, but some of the other things I know you've worked on relate to the maybe the glass half empty or the glass, we're not sure where the glass is going, part of the patterns. Um, you know, despite all of these technological advances, despite machine learning and AI taking away some of the less interesting parts of our work, in the past decade, productivity has not been rising. Mm -hmm. Wages and income, median income have been stagnating. Yes. Um, so what's behind this, what, what people have called the modern productivity paradox? Right. So we write a bit about that in our book, The Second Machine Age, and I did a much deeper dive with uh, Chad Severson and Daniel Rock in a recent paper of the National Bureau of Economic Research. We call it AI and the Modern Productivity Paradox. And, you know, to cut to the chase, the core of what's behind it is that technology alone is not enough to mm -hmm. drive productivity. In every big revolution in the past, you've had to reinvent work to take full advantage of these technologies. It's the re-engineering we were talking about a minute ago. Whether it's electricity or the steam engine or the internal combustion engine, there was massive reorganization of factories and uh, the way production was done to take full advantage of this technology. Artificial intelligence and machine learning is no different. Yes, we have vision systems and voice recognition, but we need to redesign work to take advantage of them. And that takes time. It often takes 5, 10, even 20 years for entrepreneurs and managers and workers themselves to think about these new products, processes, services to use the technologies. I wish we could speed that up. And that's why I think a lot of the focus should be, and a lot of my focus is on not simply better AI and better machine learning, but rather the economic and organizational and social reinvention yeah. of our economy. So back to the policy recommendations exactly. and what we can do to facilitate that transition. Yeah, and we're doing a, a terrible job of it, to be frank. I think uh, our economy is actually less dynamic now than it was 20 years ago, if you measure it by new startups or business formation or the number of people in young firms. Um, so we aren't translating this, I think, awesome potential of the technology into productivity the way we should be. I think it'll happen, but um, economists like me, policymakers, we all need to do a better job to keep up with our friends in the technology sector. Mm. So 
A last question about measurement. Mm -hmm. You've spoken about how um, one of the interesting things to emerge has been that we need a new way to measure all this growth that could be happening, this productivity that we may not see but might actually be there or be arriving soon. So how is digital era shaping measurement of things like GDP, well-being? Well, GDP was an amazing invention, one of the great inventions of the 20th century, Um, but it was really designed for an industrial era economy. And uh, in the work I've been doing with Avi Gananameni and Felix Eggers and others, we have shown that GDP doesn't really measure the well-being of an economy. Um, It counts the number of things produced, but we don't necessarily get value based on things just being produced. I mean, to take an example, uh, Wikipedia is available for free, and it replaced Encyclopedia Britannica by and large. Um, Britannica was expensive. It added to GDP because GDP is based on things that you have to buy and pay for. Wikipedia is free, so it doesn't add to GDP. GDP went down when Wikipedia was introduced, but welfare went up. We're all better off because we have 20 times as many articles available on Wikipedia and much more real-time information. This is one of many examples. Digital photography, social networks, search, maps. These are all free goods that don't move GDP the way they move our welfare. So in order to measure it better, we have a new approach based on what we call massive online choice experiments that seeks to assess exactly how much people value each of these goods, even if they don't have to pay for them. Mm. Once we incorporate this method more broadly, I think we'll have a much better indication of where the real value is coming in the economy. And uh, one of the punchlines is that the digital economy is much bigger and much more valuable than we would think by looking at the GDP statistics. And by the way, I should note that productivity that everyone talks about and how slow it's growing, productivity is directly based on GDP. Um, GDP is the numerator of productivity. It's it's GDP per hour worked. Mm. And so if we mismeasure GDP, guess what? We're mismeasuring productivity as well. But how does that translate into wages and income? Well, one of the effects is that we can get benefits from free goods that don't show up in wages or income. Our wages don't necessarily go up, but we get access to smartphones or Wikipedia or other goods for free, and that increases our well-being. And trying to put a number on that is exactly what our study is doing right now. Now, I want to emphasize that by no means eliminates the need to reinvent our economy, as I discussed earlier, Mm. and take advantage of these technologies to create even more productivity growth. But productivity by itself is not fully capturing the way our economy is creating value. And this is going to become one of the big challenges for the 21st century. As our consumption becomes more and more digital, we will need to have measures that work for a digital economy, not just the 20th century economy that was based on physical material Physical, tangible, you buy a book, you buy a record, et cetera. Exactly. Exactly. So just as uh, managers and entrepreneurs need to reinvent production to take advantage of the technology, statisticians and economists need to reinvent the measurement framework. And uh, we're trying to work on both of those problems. Well, thank you very much. I would ask one last question to go back to our young man in the Paris suburbs. Mm -hmm. What three pieces of advice would you give to him as he heads out into the world? I know it's a hard question (laughs) and it's... Sure. Well, no, it's it's an important question. Uh, The first one is that you've got to focus on reskilling. You know, ask yourself the question, what are the things I can do that a machine cannot do well? And if you're not sure what machines can do, go ahead and read my science article and we'll (laughs) give a little bit of an indication. Because there are still many tasks. I think most tasks in the economy, there's so much work in the economy that only humans can do. I think this hype about the end of work is way, way premature, maybe someday, maybe in a century. But today, that is not the problem. The problem today is there's so much work that only humans can do. And ask yourself, what are my unique human skills? And every person has many such skills. And I would imagine be prepared to continually reassess that as technology keeps leaping forward. Yeah, absolutely. It's evolving. So we will update our article from time to time. (laughs) But it's meant to be somewhat forward looking. So hopefully it'll last for a number of years. Um, Secondly, I I think that we often have winner take all markets more and more than the past because Mm. of digitization. And in those kinds of markets, it really pays to try to be the best in something rather than to be the eighth best or the 12th best or, you know, above average. And so think about what are some things that you are really passionate about and that you really want to be world class in. Even if it seems like a small niche area, um, if you're good enough, you can reach a global audience in a way you couldn't before. And there are so many people who are contributing value to the world today 
by really diving deep into one particular mm. narrow area. And the last piece of advice, which is um, you need to constantly reassess and rethink and, and keep up with the latest technologies so you have an understanding of how these things change. The, the era where you could go to school for 10 or 20 years and then you know be the next 50 years just work at the same job, that era is gone. Uh, we, we're in an era of continuous learning, continuous education. For most of us, I think that's an exciting, fun yes. world. Uh, it can be disruptive and it can be unsettling. But if you have an attitude of embracing the future rather than trying to freeze into the past, then you're going to be a winner in this new economy. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Many thanks to our audience for listening. To find out more about the OECD and our work, visit www.oecd.org. To find links to the works mentioned in this podcast, please go to our bio. And as always, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please like, follow, and share in all the usual places. You've been listening to OECD Podcasts.